Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. My name is Doug Cunnington. And in this episode, I talked to Larry Ludwig. He has a pretty amazing story. He sold a blog and he got about $6 million for it, which is absolutely amazing. And one cool thing, Larry and I met randomly at a bar. I was at uh, FinCon, Larry was too. And I was just walking through and he recognized me and said, hey, Doug, and then we started chatting for a bit. Unfortunately, it was a very loud bar, so we had to, to catch up later, rain check it. And we are going to catch up. We're going to talk about what Larry's working on now and hear about his story. So, Larry, how's it going today? Doing good, Doug. How about yourself? I'm doing awesome. It's uh, pretty exciting to chat with you. And I don't know too much about you. I know you have been blogging and in this world uh, for a little while, and I'm just going to, you know, launch into sort of kind of an introduction for people to, that don't know you at all. Who are you? What do you do now? And, and what was your life before you, you started blogging? So I started, I mean, geez, I've started way back when in the 90s, actually. So I developed websites for an ad agency back in the 90s and helped create some of the first Fortune 500 websites, in fact. And from there, eventually started my own business. So I did web hosting, web development back in, I started in 97, 98, and then did that for many years and saw a lot of other blogs do really well that I built for them, but yet myself not being very successful. And that's kind of where the light bulb went off in 2009. Why not I create a blog for myself to do it through affiliate marketing? Because back then too, I saw a blog called Bankaholic sell for about 12 million. And I saw that the guy was pretty much a one-man operation. And wow. yeah, he, he sold it and was like, well, if he could do that, why can't I do that through a blog myself? And on top of it, I had an interest in personal finance and investing. Looked around for blogs that didn't really – really, I couldn't find at the time in 2009 sites that spoke on that topic and spoke to my, what my needs were in the sense that I had – I wasn't. I didn't have issues with Dave, like a Dave Ramsey. I wasn't massively in debt. I didn't have. I understood finance pretty well, but I didn't. I couldn't find a site that spoke to what my needs were. So I created Investor Junkie in 2009 as kind of a, a proof of concept to show not only could I monetize a blog through affiliate marketing, but could I actually just really use it as a showcase for technology. Worst case scenario, I looked at, and it built this blog into really a business more than itself for my web hosting, web development. And so fast forward eight years later or nine years later, I sold it in 2018. Wow. I'm amazed that you were doing web development in, you know, you said the late nineties, basically. Early, so. Actually early 94 was the first site I helped start create. Yeah. Really early. Wow. That's I'm, an, an, I'm an old timer in the, the web development space. Yes. And does that, um, precede Google? Like, I, Oh yeah. Yeah. Then right. Back then, it was Alta Vista. It was Google. It was uh, uh, Yahoo, I should say. Um, right. Alta Vista was the big one. Uh, Hotbot, which was from Wired Magazine. Okay. Yeah, I remember Alta Vista, and then we were using like the Netscape browser, or or maybe yeah. even like the AOL like web browser, something like that. Holy it, crap! The Netscape browser was like literally every new version. It would come out some new feature, and we were like googling what new feature came out in Netscape at the time. And SSL was just starting then too. So this is really early, early, early. Cookies didn't even exist when I first started. That's how far back I go. <laughs> uh, you had to use 256 colors for for um, you know web design. Uh, you had to do dial up modems. It was really, it's ironic how things go in phases and kind of what's old is new again. We were on these really small miniature screens and we go to these big desktops. Now we're going back to small screens again. Yeah. That's amazing. So were you coding by hand or were you using something like Dreamweaver or? Didn't even exist at the time. I mean, front page was really early and that was even before Microsoft acquired it. Uh, we didn't use front page. We hand coded HTML and, and used things like Perl to develop the web pages. And, and at the time Oracle had a thing that was made sites database driven. And again, that's really, really going back to where there was no WordPress, you know, blog, there was no, you know, programming languages really existed as far as web-based, you know, PHP didn't exist. Java didn't, Java was just starting at the time. Um, JavaScript was very, very new. In fact, they didn't even call it JavaScript at the time. They called it, uh, I forget something. Yeah. They eventually renamed it Java because JavaScript was a uh, JavaScript because Java was very popular. Wow. Yeah. For the younger 
uh, part of the audience. You don't even know what we're talking about, but we carried around pagers and we didn't even have cell phones. So <laughs> it was a different time. People had phones in their home. Yeah, yeah. you had to dial up and, and download an image and it would take like 15 minutes for like one small image. Yeah. Okay. It so, was painful. <laughs> it, yeah. I, I don't even know how we, it, it was amazing though. Like I remember like trying to download something and then walking away, maybe checking it the next morning to see if it was downloaded. Of course it got cut yeah. off or something, but yeah, someone picked up the phone. Yeah. Okay. So you realize that you could potentially like go out on your own. You had uh, I'm not sure if it was an agency, but you were building websites and doing things on your own. Did you have like an entrepreneurial spirit spirit, like, from a young age or did this just kind of happen by accident? Well, I, I mean, I, so I graduated computer science at Clemson university and my, the exit interview, they asked me, what do I want to do? And I was like, I knew right away I wanted to own a business. Uh, that, that was something, something I always knew. And I guess in terms of, um, so I always had some sort of entrepreneurial spirit in me and first jobs I did were in fact, not even web-based the job I took at the ad agency was like the second job out of college or third job out of college. And it was just, again, really, I knew that was the, the future of this industry, but there was no, literally when I graduated in 93, there were no jobs in web development. It was such an early thing. Again, there was maybe a few hundred websites, a handful that existed, but I knew this would change the way we really use the internet and make it much more consumer friendly, but it, it just wasn't ready yet. So, I finally you know, found two years later an ad agency that was really the pioneer in this space called Poppy, uh, Poppy Tyson or poppy.com and really helped. They initially developed white, uh, websites for Netscape themselves, uh, the White House. Um, you know, I worked with companies like Chase developing their first version of their website. And it was pretty, again, literally every version of Netscape, there would be some new functionality or feature. And it was like, a gold mine or, or like literally candy, uh, you know, playing with new toys. Uh, it was really pretty amazing. Yeah. What a nerd, a CS degree. Yeah, exactly. So that fits in. I love it. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to fast forward. So I'm not burying all this, um, sort of exciting information, the exit. So 2018, you sold the site we're going to come back to the beginning, but in 2018, you sold the site around $6 million. There's a lot that you can't tell us. So I won't ask specific questions, but if you could tell us anything you can about sort of traffic or earnings or things that you can share, obviously I don't want to put you in a situation where yeah. lawyers are sending you in, uh, emails. <laughs> Cease and desist. Um, so yeah, I sold it in 2018 for 6 million. Um, the site literally, so I started the site from zero in 2009 and it, it, it slowly grew up from there. I mean, what I can tell you is I can't reveal exact visitors, but it definitely was around 300,000. Was it per month? I think it was, is the peak. Um, and probably more now with the new owners, but, um, it definitely grew. So I grew the site purely from SEO. There was no other way I, you know, we, we did some paid traffic, but most of that traffic was organic search and it just took, you know, the first two years I almost gave up in fact, ironically. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, definitely, I mean, for SEO and just blogging itself, it's not a quick, there's no quick riches. There's no instant, you know, you build a site and next week you get, you know, tons of traffic. It doesn't work that way. And that, that even goes back to the early days, 2009, where, you know, some of the early blogging platforms were really just getting started and maybe we're hearing about it a little bit more, but I mean, it seems like, or one would think it would have been much easier to rank. So what, what was going on those first two years that almost made you quit? Um, I, well, prior to that, it's like I said, I had a web hosting web development company and I knew about SEO and I knew the importance of it, but I wasn't very good at it. In fact, my, my first foray in SEO, I hired a firm to help me with my hosting business to help increase the rankings. And it really turned out to be, I spent a lot of money and got zero results. So I, I made the commitment, I really must learn this stuff, I really must understand SEO. And, and with the blog I, I created, Investor Junkie, I did just that. So it took a while to really understand things like intent, things about being, you know, how to write copy and how to write content that's not for purely SEO, but it, um, Google can understand it better. And understanding intent really matters in this space, especially now more than ever. Uh, and 
it really took a while to understand that because I'd write content or in, articles that have interest in me or interest for me in investing, but it really didn't have any SEO value. So people weren't searching for it. And the kind of light bulb went off about a year and a half in of maybe I should be writing content that Google can help you know, better find. So I started looking into what way, what articles can I write that people do search on? And again, this is kind of the precursor of there was no hrefs where you could figure out you have you know, X amount of volume for the said keyword. You, you either kind of had to guess or use tools like maybe Google themselves to kind of figure it out. Okay. And you started the site from scratch, sort of writing the blog that you wanted to be able to read and that sort of thing. Did you ever have any partners or other like owners in the, in the business? Um, no, the business itself. No. I mean, I eventually hired an editor in my first editor was in 2011, 12, I think it was. And she helped write, you know, better manage the content, better write, better edit my content in terms of grammar and spelling, um, things I was not good at, or still not good at, but uh, ultimately, you know, I had someone to make sure really proofread my content. Um, so that really helped too. But I didn't have any business partners. I did it really all on my own. I mean, I had previously business partners for my web hosting business, but that was long prior to that, creating Investor Junkie. Okay. And at what point or did you ever go sort of full time with Investor Junkie? And if you could sort of place us um, like in the timeline, of course, and then maybe what was going on with your agency. I don't know what happened there, if you left it or anything like that. I, well, I mean, around 2012, 2013 is where it really started taking off the block. And from there, realized that could generate probably more revenue from this blog than from my hosting business, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting in itself. And did, in fact, so it, it went up very quickly. I mean, if you look at like a, uh, it, you know, the first few years it generated very little and then slow, slowly, it will very quickly ramped it up to, you know, easily six, six figure business, seven figure business at one point. So it definitely grew very quickly uh, after I really understood the intent. It wasn't necessarily writing articles for me. It was writing articles that people had interest in or people would be searching for. And I think that's a key distinction. If anything could people take away would be to understand that you can't write for, you're not writing a blog for yourself. You're writing to help others in that process of whatever pain point they have be. In my case, for investing, where if you're writing a blog for, let's say, exercise, you should be writing not for your sake, but for helping others become better at, say, losing weight or gaining muscle. Yep. Very good. Okay. So it took about three years to really get traction. And then it was pretty much clear that the potential for Investor Junkie was was there and you were ready to you know push a little harder i mean there was there's a few setbacks like everyone has as an entrepreneur uh i had an issue with panda update this is going back to 2013 and so i i recovered from that i mean really every and then i had another issue in 2016 as well i think it was 2016 where i had another update from google in fact actually it was probably a negative seo problem that affected the site that i really it really helped me understand SEO to the, the degree I know nowadays. And it really, I mean, with like any business, whatever, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I definitely, I think with SEO and the, the problems I had along the way made me better at SEO and made, made me better understand how Google works and how SEO really works and really making sure, I mean, the common issue with a lot of SEO people is they, they over monetize or not understand how much intent matters for a page. And I think that's a key issue that uh, definitely a good takeaway is making sure you understand who, not only who the audience is you're writing for, but making sure Google does not like to see stuff that's too transactional on a page. Got it. And you read my mind. I was going to ask you about various algorithm updates. So Panda hits you, maybe yep. negative SEO in 2016. And as time has gone on, there are, there are more frequent updates that potentially can impact, especially a financial type blog. So do you have any other stories and can you give us an idea of the scope of the issue with Panda, for example, like how much traffic dropped? Uh, traffic. That's a good question. Um, I don't remember. I would have to say around 20% of loss of traffic. It wasn't devastating, but it was enough that it made me again, understand, you know, how much, well, one is, especially the second issue with the negative SEO, how much you need to not rely on purely Google 
you know, we rely, I mean, the two major issues with affiliate marketing is you're relying on Google for a lot of your traffic. And then you're also relying on, uh, you know, affiliates. And if the affiliates dry up, you could potentially lose a lot of revenue very quickly, literally overnight. I mean, I had affiliates that would just close shop, you know, because they're, they're venture capital funded. They would just say, we're, we're no longer in business. We're going to shut down our affiliate program and you're done at the end of the month. Goodbye. Man. Yeah. And uh, they probably owed you money too, right? Not just future income. Some cases, yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> that was definitely an issue too. Well, let's uh, shift gears into the monetization. So investor junkie, that's the financial industry. They, those guys have a lot of money. So I suspect some of the affiliate deals were really good. Um, can you tell us like either some of the companies that you worked with, maybe you can't do that, or maybe like marketplaces and generalities of so people can get an idea of the affiliate deals you were working with? Yeah, I mean, some of it may not even apply actually nowadays. I mean, what I could do, it'd probably be better to give industries. So I worked, a lot of it was in the robo-advisor. That's really a big space nowadays. Um, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, really covered the full gamut, both in terms of a lot of the fintech in the past few years has really grown exponentially. I mean, a lot of innovation in that space, which has been great. I mean, ironically, the first article I wrote was on a service called Lending Club that actually doesn't even exist nowadays. Uh, this is to show you as an example of how quickly fintech changes. I mean, Lending Club is no longer, and they're now just purely a bank in itself. And I, But I, I wanted to – initially, again, I created this article on Lending Club about how to – how I could become a better investor in investing in notes – Ironically, you know, again, I, that was my first article, but it didn't do very well monetarily wise in terms of affiliate marketing. Uh, but a lot of people did like it and did generate a following of here's my performance year over or month every month. And here's what I did to increase my revenue or my investments in that uh, service. Got it. So it's, maybe some of those some of those deals have fallen off, but generally it was like with financial companies so that there were some big commissions, uh, I take it. Yeah, I mean, but not every. I mean, this is a problem with affiliate marketing. You can, ha you're on one hand, it's great because you get rewarded on cost per action. In other words, you don't get a commission unless they convert. The problem is because of that being said, you're relying on the merchant to properly make sure they monetize or properly lead them down a sales funnel once they leave your site. So, you know, I could tell nowadays what affiliate programs will do really well and some will do really poorly because of the, the merchant just doesn't understand affiliate marketing. They'll, they'll send it to the homepage as a classic example, or the offer is just not enticing. And to me as affiliate marketer, you've got to really understand not all offers are created equal and not all merchants you work with are going to convert. You know, I, I had merchants who had the the, the thought that just because we get a lot of traffic, a lot of, a lot of targeted traffic, that instantly adding their site on our blog would instantly convert. And it wasn't always the case. There were cases where we would, you know, they would literally convert zero. And it was because of the, the offer wasn't right or because of, you know, build it and they will come doesn't necessarily happen with affiliate marketing. You know, we got to understand where in the sales funnel your blog sits. And for at least a review and compare site, it's usually one of the last touch points before they finally convert, where the the merchant has to do a lot of the you know other touch points up higher on that funnel before they get to your blog. And I think a lot of some some merchants get that, a lot don't. They they really want it. They expect just because you mentioned that their product on your site, you know, instant, even though you get three hundred thousand visitors per month, that you're going to convert, and that's not always the case. Yep, yeah, that is an excellent point. I'm actually running into this and maybe ties to the conversation we were having off off the record earlier, but like I'm running some ads on my platform right now. And a lot of times companies will just want to push an affiliate deal, but I'm trying to push them towards ads because sometimes their offer sucks and they do a shitty job at converting. And they yeah. think just because they get some eyes on it, I could just paraphrase what you said, but basically yeah. sometimes they need to get the offer right beforehand. And there's probably ways to test that. And I'm going to, I'm going to lob a question to you. So were there specific like skills that you learned at the ad agency that helped you number one, maybe identify those products that would convert well as affiliate or in general in analyzing the traffic on investor junkie? 
I mean, I, I became much better at it with Investor Junkie. So I, I definitely understood the sales funnel and what would convert or not. Well, one is because I had much more, much better data. So my goal always has been to have the same data as if I owned the product myself. So I have conversion metrics then and now to measure, you know, what's the conversion rate for that merchant? Where, you know, where are they converting on my site? What pages are they converting from? Where again, intent, not only for SEO matters a lot, but also on your site where, you know, what button they're clicking on is more likely to convert than, you know, in some cases not always obvious. I mean, I'm having with the new blog I just acquired, which we mentioned you know, previously as well, I'm having conversions that I did not expect. And without that data, you're kind of flying blind. And I think that's a key issue in affiliate marketing is a lot of affiliate marketers just, you know, look at the end of the month of a statement that says you have had, you know, X amount of conversions and they're just happy. And to me, that's not the right way to your, I mean, same thing with SEO, you got to take this, this black box of how things are converting on your site and make it clear. And it requires, you know, the, tool, the right tools to do that. And uh, full disclosure, I am one of those people that do not track well enough. I love data, but I was just, I've been too lazy to actually do anything with it. So one question I have for you is, what is the conversion point? So do you consider the conversion as clicking from your site over or do you, are you able to track the actual purchase or, you know, exchange of money for that specific affiliate? I offer? mean, it depends on the merchant. Yeah, it's a good question. It depends on the merchant. Um, some you'll give you, you know, uh, you know, per lead or someone will give you per certain, like a certain investment services would actually require them not only to sign up, but then to deposit money as well before we even got a commission. Um, some services like DoorDash require you not to just sign up, but to actually do your first drive. Uh, so we actually can track literally to the, the point of actually, you know, when they convert and then know where on my site they clicked last and then therefore converted from. So therefore not every page, like a review, sometimes comparison pages do better than a review page in terms of conversions because of the intent they're, they're already with one service and now trying to compare another and they're trying to figure out which one is the best one for them. And in some cases that can convert better than a review page, believe it or not. Sure. And what, what do you use for this tracking? <laughs> um, a bunch of, some of it originally I developed in-house for Investor Junkie. And I, when I sold Investor Junkie, they didn't want that, that technology. So I said, okay, I want to make sure I own it. So I, I now own it. And now use that and sell that to others. So I have a, it's called affiliate marketing automated, and it's really a bunch of a collection of tools. Part, some of them public, some of them, you know, some of my code I've developed to then better facilitate the transactions and tracking of those affiliates. So it it really the the base is ClickMeter itself. So I use that tool a lot, and then on top of that, I add an analytic tool called Woopra to really track all the data of the journey of that person or the multiple touch points they come from, you know, various, you know, various websites or, or other actions they do on my site. So it's a much more detailed analytics than say Google analytics, which is just in my eyes, a toy in comparison. Got it. And do you have like videos and stuff on this so we could potentially link up or? Um, not yet. I mean, that's something I definitely need to work on. I have some basics on my own site. I, we can link up in terms of okay. the products, but in terms of, um, Videos of what could be done now. I mean, I, I've been sort of keeping it on the QT at the moment. I'm slowly ramping that up and offering it to others. But I have a few. I have a bunch of clients who really love it. I mean, from my end, I'm obviously I'm not trying to make this a pitch for my product, but it, in the end, it's it's something that there's there's a few other analytic tools that can do this, but not to the level of detail that I offer. Um, we can get down to literally what pages are your your best money making pages, and then compare that to, you know, how does it compare to ads ad spend. Or I'm sorry, ad banners. You know, can you, if you're making more money through affiliate, why bother having an ad banner? Right. Which, yeah, all this data is great. And Larry, we'll talk afterwards for this free advertisement you tricked me into asking you about. But <laughs> I, I mean, that was where that's where we were leading anyway. So that's yeah. cool. Um, but and yeah, we'll we'll definitely link up because this. I mean, I literally get emails, and I'm sure you do too. People want to track to that level. But there's a host of problems. You know, a lot of people will try, they'll try to track, but they don't have enough data. So they're, you know, they're looking at a hundred visitors a day and it's just not statistically going to give them any information that's really yeah. that useful. 
um, until they get more, which I, I don't know what the threshold is. Is there some amount of traffic where this yeah, becomes useful? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, well, there's two factors. The first is, like you said, revenue. And I would say that's usually in the five figure range. So you've got to be, like, say, mid five figures. So, like, say, around 50,000 a month. Um, and that's usually the big affiliate players. Uh, and then on top of that, if you're doing paid ad spend, if you're not, it really becomes much more critical when you start paying for traffic. If you're getting organic traffic, people don't care as much. I mean, they should, but they don't care as much when they start paying for it. When you start paying for it, you want to know, are you really ROI positive? And this allows you to do that very easily. Cool. A anything else with the, with the tracking or sort of analytics side that I didn't ask you about that I should have? Um, no, I mean the, it really, so to me, the problem with Google, right? I mean, the biggest issue I have with basic analytics nowadays, it's very much, you have things like Google analytics. You have, if you're using thrive card for your ordering processing, that's another tool that has analytics. You have your email system, let's say active campaign. Each of these have these data silos or these reporting that really just don't gel together into one report. And so you don't really see the full picture of that person and the touch points they've done along the way, where, I mean, like no different than having your own product. You want to know, okay, they, they came in through this mobile device, they signed up to your mailing list, they opened up these emails, they then went to your website through another device, and then they finally signed up for this affiliate link, you know, you know, two days later or three days later. And Google Analytics doesn't really show you that. I mean, you might be able to, again, get the data from, Click meter, you might be able to get some of it from Google Analytics, you might be able to get some of it from the web, from um, your email tool, but not in one place. So Whooper really shows you that full journey along the way. Got it. So I want to jump back to keyword research. And you mentioned kind of in the early days, you really didn't have anything to lean on as far as an actual keyword research tool. Yeah. And you started writing what you thought might be interesting and then you realize you should write what other people are actually searching for. So as tools were developed, can you talk about how the strategy changed and maybe how you were maybe doing the keyword research towards, I would say, you know, maybe 2013 on when the tools were more sophisticated? Yeah. I, so, okay. I started, so I, I realized again, started writing for what others, the intent matters in Google, like we've talked about. I started writing articles on, believe it or not, promotions. I, I realized promotions in fintech was not really widely used at the time, especially investing, and wrote some promotional, like here's the current promotion for Trade King, and would write an article on that. And that's kind of how I initially got a lot of traffic because I ranked really well. Those also are high intent uh, keywords. And I didn't really get my first tool, Ahrefs, until 2016, believe it or not. So I was kind of flying blind. I would use you know, various tools like Google Google's ad, you know, ad search tool and trying to estimate stuff, but I would not use any paid tools at the time. I was really flying blind at the time, which is kind of probably a foolish thing in retrospect nowadays. Uh, I mean, I definitely would not recommend it for anyone just starting now. But back then, you know, the tools were just starting to emerge. You know, Ahrefs was still somewhat new. And from that, it gave me definitely, a, it definitely helped make Google's black box clear again, which is key. Again, how much volume you're doing, uh, what keywords are better than others. You know, what order in some cases keywords matter? You know, the I mentioned a recent article uh, on my site, you know, um, the current blog I bought is in web hosting as well, right? And it's reviews of various services, one of them being Bluehost, a very popular web hosting company. And the original SEO uh, or author created Bluehost Hosting Review, whereas Bluehost Hosting Review gets a lot less traffic than Bluehost Review, even though, you know, they're the intent was it turns out to be exactly the same. So why, and difficulty as well. So why go after the keyword Bluehost hosting review where you're better off going with just after Bluehost's review, which was kind of weird. You know, that's stuff that, you know, normally if you don't have the tools nowadays, you wouldn't know that. You know, back maybe, you know, 10 years ago, you maybe try that out and maybe you think that's the right tool, but that's, or the right keywords, but it, you know, matters more than ever nowadays, especially with the BERT update from Google, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I use the analogy of man or dog bites man and man bites dogs with the same words, but the intent is clearly different. And that's no different than, you know, blue host hosting review. You may want to mention the word hosting in the title, but not put it in that order because clearly blue hosts review is much more important. And yep. maybe put then, is it a good web host or something like that after it? 
Got it. And then it sounded like you were doing most of the writing for Investor Junkie and then, you know, brought the editor on and, and maybe she was doing a little bit more. But from a content perspective, any specific tips, obviously, things um, that matter I, now, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually started hiring writers very quickly, actually. Um, okay. That was one thing I think was a really smart decision is I started once I got the editor, started hiring various writers around the same time. And actually, <laughs> When 2018 came around, I was really just doing, uh, as a managing editor, just updating content or looking over what the writers were writing and doing very little new content, in fact. Um, so I guess in terms of tips or recommendations, I would say, geez, I mean, I guess, what would I recommend? I guess in terms of what you definitely first understand the topics at some level, but then you know hire writers that might be, be able to write it better for you and write it more in mass. But also write quality articles. I mean, I think in the end, it's not about a not writing more words than the competing key or competing articles are ranking for, but writing better quality articles. And I've always been much more about content as a commodity. I mean, this is a good tip as well. Content as a commodity, and to me, adding more functionality is more important on your blog. And that's one of the things I really focused on was adding functionality that the competing sites didn't have like a comparison tool to say which robo advisor is better for me and right you know creating tools to automate all that too so that was one thing we did that a lot of the other bloggers would just write you know another article that had 2001 words as opposed to the competing articles had 2000 words and to me that was kind of an arms race that just went nowhere right. to me i was trying to write try to create better tools or better ways to facilitate or better ways to show that data on the blog yeah it was an interesting time where people just kept writing longer and longer. And like you said, it's a commodity. You could just add more words, but at some point people want the answer. And if you have a article that's more concise and I mean, well, it's like present, this, present it better. Right. I mean, there's so many ways to just like get the answer to the person more quickly. And that should probably have better, you know, user engagement, hopefully. And I think we see that like you, you know, mentioned many times with user intent or searcher intent and just, I mean, we've well, I all, God. Yeah, I was just saying, I mean, I had the analytics. So with Woopera, I had the analytics to measure, again, what buttons were more clicked on and or converted. We also use stuff like Crazy Egg to really look at, you know, for as far as convert, it comes down to conversion rate optimization, where where people are really hot on the page and where are they really cold and where can we better optimize or add in, you know, let's say a comparison tool or your know, screenshots or adding a, you know, a table of features and then get them to keep, scrolling down the page and read and more engaged on that page. And that in, in the effect helps with SEO in the long run. And those are things, again, that's not purely a content play. It's, it's much more about improving your user experience, to your point, is making the experience better. And in some cases, you do want to satisfy that. Don't, you know, don't make me think, tell me the answer. But some do literally read the whole page and then, then some read other pages on your site and you know, go down that rabbit hole and you want to satisfy both those, those audiences. Have you played much with the AI tools? And I, I get questions all the I time. I hear you say that, yeah. That's so, kind of the, I mean, that goes back to the whole content as a commodity where now bots are, are eventually going to be writing our content. I've not yet. That's something I'm going to be probably doing in the next six months just to test. Something I fear is not, it's not completely gelled yet. Uh, but at some point, I mean, I, I use the analogy of sort of with um, deep fake, right? Not to say deep fake is perfected yet, but at some point as a personality, you will, you'll be able to have someone pretend to be you speaking and or presenting in a podcast or video like we're doing now. And it's, you would be the wiser. It's not you speaking, but someone literally pretending to be you. And we're getting close to that. The same thing with AI as far as writing. I think we're going to come to a point where some basic stuff has already been, you know, AI written, like especially sporting events is now, a lot of sporting content that's you know showing stores or information about a game is AI driven, and I think eventually all the, most of the content will be AI driven. So it'll be an arms race. It'll be Google bot versus bot is been my whole take on it. That Google your Google is obviously a bot trying to you know figure out who writes good content, but yet meanwhile you'll be using a bot to write the said content. <laughs> How long do you think it'll be before we're there? Um. I have a good question. I would say at least four or five years. Okay. I, I, I think it, I, I don't think the person will ever get out of the loop completely. I think you do need people to review content and look at the content, but from a much higher level 
So you may have a bot create the initial version of it, but I don't think we completely get the editor or the man out of the loop, so to speak, yep. to to make it where it's just generated automatically and no human involvement. Right. I don't think that ever will be I don't think you can because you've you should definitely create a bunch of gibberish. Yeah. And I um I haven't played around too much recently, but I would say like in the last six months or a year or sorry, six or nine months or so, I've played around with a couple tools and it was kind of garbage. And I do see there are a lot of reviews out there and some some of the folks are my friends. So uh, I won't mention anyone specifically, but they're really? affiliates. They're fucking affiliates. Yeah. So it's like, okay, like they're obviously pushing the product and maybe it gets someone a rough draft or something like that. But from the standpoint, like you said, I mean, maybe it'll be four or five years. It could be a year or 10 years or whatever. Like we well, obviously don't know, but it's like some well, of this garbage. The example, I mean, let's use the example of Surfer, Surfer SEO. Sure. I use that a lot, actually, and I like that tool. But I don't use it as gospel in the sense of you must have, you know, if it gives you a recommendation, you must mention this keyword 10 times. I don't look at it like, okay, I need to do just that. I look at it as what con- where are my content gaps? So instead of ma- – previously, I would use it uh, without, you know, forget about Surfer SEO, but when I owned Investor Junkie, we would do this manually. We would literally go at the you know, top 10 search results and see what was ranking and see what they were discussing in those articles and then do a competitive analysis of those articles to the, improve ours. Surfer allows you to do that in literally you know, two minutes or less. And you can now get the data to say, okay, here's where our contact gaps are. This is what we need to discuss. And here's certain metrics that they're using or certain metrics that Google's using that are important that you need to make sure you also you know, match yours as well. I mean, again, it becomes much more commoditized and homogenized data, which is a, an issue I have you know, from a – Google only is expecting this content to be a certain, you know, level and therefore everyone else is doing the exact same thing. There's not, there's not much variety in, in the SEO content nowadays. And that's definitely becoming an issue. It's homogenization of the data. Are you good to go a little bit over the top of the hour here? Yeah, yeah. No, no rush at all. Okay, cool. So I want to talk about link building now. So o- over the years, uh, you know, some link building strategies have gone up and down. So I'm curious, you know, from the beginning, can you talk about link building you did or did not do? And you you can go back as far as you want. I mean, ironically, I didn't do much link building until I hired an SEO firm in when I had the issues with my negative SEO. I, I, I didn't do much link building at all. I let it really happen organically, believe it or not. I know people are going to not want to hear that, but I focus a lot on user experience. I really made sure we wrote the best content, had the best presented content out there for, for various reviews we did. And I think that's, we got really rewarded and got a lot of backlinks for that reason. Um, outside of that, I mean, there was very, I did very little. I only maybe did once or twice buy backlinks. And that was really at the very beginning. And I don't recommend most people do that at all. I mean, you see a lot of, a lot of bloggers recommend buying backlinks or using uh, PBNs, you know, private uh, networks, and to get backlinks for those. But I, I think you're playing with fire. I mean, ultimately, you can have this huge. I've seen many bloggers, and in, in, especially in the personal finance space, do just that: have these stratifor, you know, really quick rises and then quick crashes because if Google figures out that you're using a PBN, and then ultimately they disappear. I've seen many bloggers do that, and they, you know, they they're riding high one minute and they're gone the next. And can you talk about the negative SEO, like what was done and how it was remedied? Yeah, I mean, it was to make a long story short, Google didn't, Google saw the information when I used other tools like Ahrefs, they did not see the pages at all. So whoever was doing it, and I'm pretty sure it was, I almost know exactly who did it without revealing the information, but it was a competing personal finance blogger at the time that had literally the experience and mentioned about doing PBNs and doing negative SEO. And I'm pretty sure I suspect that this person did just that for my own blog. And it affected me, affected the blog dramatically, actually. It lost about 30% of its traffic. And I had a block about a thousand back a thousand domains. And these were pages again that were not showing up in any of the the, the you know search tools out there that you should use. I used I literally bought SEM Rush, Ahrefs, um, I forget the other tools off the top of my head, but literally had all these different tools and they didn't show up in those, those you know, linking tools. 
And I had went to Google and it showed up there and only there. Okay. And it was where they, they you know, hid from the, the various tools and they showed up in only Google. Okay. And ultimately, yeah, they really were nasty. So it, once I did that, it, it took the SEO part of it quickly regained in about six months. But the certain, like I had, had a lot of featured snippets and featured snippets fall on a different time frame. I had zero featured snippets for about a year and a half. Oh, man. Because of the way the time frame of that featured snippets are on a totally different time. I think it's sort of changed now. But back then it would be on a completely different time frame. And because, you know, featured snippets, you had a certain amount of trustworthiness in the eyes of Google. And if they didn't trust you, you'd have, you know, no featured snippets. And that's exactly what I had. So it was almost positive this was a you know trust issue, both in terms of the SEO and then featured snippets, because again, the featured snippets didn't show up much later. Okay. And I'm gonna rephrase a couple of things just to break it down for people. So yeah. someone sent a bunch of bad links to your site and whatever um, sites they were on had like a robots blocker for SEMrush, for Majestic, yep. for Hrefs. Yep. So any yep. of the third party tools could not crawl the site. They did not know that they were linking to yours. So they didn't show up. However, yep. Google knew that they were there and then you had to go in and disavow a thousand plus domains. Yep. Okay. Man, that sucks. Okay. So that was it 2016. Was big, yeah. It was a big pain in the butt, put it nicely. Um, but it, in the end, it, it helped me understand too, because also there in that time was really looking at is our intent off as well. Like in other words, we would do things like have a call to action above the fold. We would have the link of the, the logo, the brand's logo in the review linked to the affiliate link. And all those things I kind of downplayed and l literally made everything above the fold informational because Google ultimately does not want to see how, you know, they, they definitely do not like affiliates, uh, affiliate blogs, and they want to see how much value you add. So they want to see you, you know, inf add value to a page and just purely, you know, people, land on your page, then bounce off to somewhere else. Google does not like that. Got it. Anything else link building related or penalties or anything like that? Um, with link building, I mean, so the, the way we took it was to build the great content. And then ultimately with the ad agency or SEO agency I hired, they helped me build out various you know, really content that helped build backlinks, like doing like a, P, a PR campaign or doing like a, a white paper on, you know, what, the average a person has to invest and that leaded to, you know, getting backlinks that way. So that's one strategy. I mean, there's, there's a million other strategies you can do as well, but um, we did primarily the basics of building good content first. Cause I, I looked at it as backlinks are hard to come by back, especially this day and age, and it's hard to get a backlink. So I'd rather focus on the area I can control. And I focused on first, you know, the content, you know, the, the way the site was, how user experience was first, and then, you know, let the backlinks, at least we focused on that second. And that was, that was a key, a key distinction is most, I, I think to speed things up, we should probably have done more backlinks initially. But uh, again, I think in the end, we created a really top notch site in the end. And well, sort of full circle, we met at FinCon and I often encourage people, you know, don't go on a link building campaign, like network if you can. So did you go to FinCon for many years and did you make contacts? And I mean, that's one of the best ways to get yeah. links. Like you, you're not asking. To, yeah. I mean, I got a lot of, not, not only for writers, but also a lot of other, you know, I discussed with a lot of now friends of mine about what they're doing on their blogs. And we definitely, it definitely helps under, you know, especially in a community like that. FinCon is great because if they're, it's really discussing, the various things about how to write, you know, how to build a better business or build a better blog. And, um, yeah, I went to FinCon starting in 2012, in fact. Uh, so, uh, one, you know, I went for when it was really small and met up with a lot of people I'm still friends to today. It's a cool conference. It's, it's definitely, fun. I mean, it's for a financial conference. It's definitely not, it's very laid back. It's not like a traditional, you know, if you go to any, you know, investment uh, conference, it's completely different. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't been to any of those, but yeah, everyone at FinCon was so approach, approachable and just, yeah. it, it didn't seem competitive. You know, I know some other conferences, it's like everyone's trying to step over your back as they push you over, you know, but <laughs> FinCon is good. Okay. Yeah. So how did this blog change your life and sort of impact you? I mean, ultimately 
it allowed me to well again the, the pivot point was probably when I, I I had the Trade King brokerage house promotion where I, I made enough money where it was actually more than I did for web hosting that month. And that's kind of where I knew I mean I knew beforehand, like I said, Bankaholic sold for about twelve million. I knew and on top of that I went to FinCon too and saw various other friends who literally sold their businesses for six figures and knew it was a viable you know opportunity. But you really want, you know, you don't really know until you actually get there, type of thing. And once I started generating revenue for the business, realized that it was possible, you know, possible to do this. And in the end, you know, it it, it revolutionized my life because of it allowed me to give it really more time and freedom. Where I hated web hosting. Web hosting, while you know, it's it's a needed industry, it's a really crappy business to be in. Uh, it's such a commodity. I really was working my ass off. I was working 24 seven. You know, I, I was not a reseller. I actually had data, servers in a data center and it was a lot, it was really a stressful job or stressful business. And, you know, doing blogging is much more laid back. You can literally generate revenue while you're sleeping where I could do that with web hosting, but not for, sometimes a server would literally fail, you know, two o'clock in the morning and I was on call that day and had to do it. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of times that you acquired a blog. Can you tell us what you're working on now? And I mean, you are blogging over at your own blog, at your name. We'll link up to it. But yeah, what kind of stuff are you doing today? So I, I bought, I mean, one of the problems I have with Investor Junkie, as much as I did very well with it, I can't, per my NDA, discuss various details or examples. So I can't use it as a white paper or case, case study to say, this is what I did to build out a blog. So Last August, this past August in 2021, bought a blog that's actually in web hosting, oddly enough. It's a review and compare site for web hosting services and going to eventually merge it with my personal brand at LarryLudwood.com. But the goal is to show here's what I did to take a site that was really lost a lot of SEO traffic, uh, not monetized very well. And what can you do to monetize it more effectively? How to, and I had the tools like my affiliate marketing automated tool to then track, you know, conversions and then again, showcase sort of what I did for investor junkie initially was to showcase, here's what I can do with a WordPress blog. Here's now what I can do to you know, build a better blog from where it was. Got it. And you're only not, not even a few months in. So can you tell us anything about it? How's it going? Is it like you expected it? Um, yeah, I mean, overall, the inter- it's it's always the when you're in the, the trenches, it's always slower than you expect. I mean, that's the, the funny part. But it is – it's interesting in that – so I, one of the things that I saw right away was the, the, the SEO was really messed up in that he lost – the previous owner lost a lot of traffic in the past two years. And it was a lot of things that could be fixable in that it's more it's, – some of it's copy changes, but a lot of it was navigation menu changes. So and and weird URL structures where it would have the post ID at the very beginning, you know, things that I would never do as a, a, a blogger nowadays. Also, also the sites existed for ten years, so it's been around for many years. So the first thing and foremost is I changed the whole menu structure and pages like certain keywords like Bluehost Review were all like on the fiftieth, sixtieth, you know, you know, sixtieth or fifty to sixty uh, results, but it now is so fifth to sixth page, so now it's on second page. Just by changing not even the content, but just changing, adding to the main menu, changing the URL, changing the site structure and categorization of the pages. Gotcha. And when you, or I guess, do you have a timeline for revealing what you're working on and some of the results? I think it'll be an interesting case study for people to follow along, which they can at, at your blog, I think. Yeah. I'm, I've, yeah, I've been doing that. I have to update. I have to create a new post on the SEO findings. Um, yeah, I've been trying to do that on a monthly basis. So I'm do, overdue actually for the SEO one, but, um, sure. it, it's the, you know, I'm, I'm in the trenches and haven't had the time to write the article. So hopefully it's like 90% done. So hopefully I'll get it done this next week. Cool. Uh, but with that said, yeah, I mean, it's, it, the, so it's definitely great to show, you know, what you've done and then help others in that same process. I mean, I think that's really key, right? And I think that's something you've done really well too, is really, you can write, you know, here's an example of what I've done and here's the results from it. And it's great because people can understand it and then apply it to their own blog. And that's something that definitely I want to make sure, you know, people can take this simple knowledge of just 
how well you design your sites, you know, site structure wise, makes a difference in SEL. And it's pretty dramatic. It can mean a difference from this case from being, say, 50th or 60th position to, you know, let's say in the top 10 to 20. And just simply by changing, not even the contents change, it's just purely how you structure the site. And it's, it's amazing that Google really responds to stuff like that. Very cool. Well, Larry, this has been awesome. And like I said, we'll link up so people could find your stuff. Is there anything else you want to mention here as we're uh, wrapping up? No, I mean, I, 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 we talked about this offline. I mean, I, the, so I have a, a blog, um, of course, I should say on full-time blogger. The whole goal is to take existing bloggers who are struggling to you know, make their site into a full-time business. And I have a course on that. And it's called full-time blogger. Very cool. Yeah. And you have an email list people can sign up for. You send out great information there. So yeah, we'll link up for everything. And hopefully, Larry, we'll, we'll get you back on in a few months. You can give us an update, what's going on with the case study and the acquisition and merging and all that stuff. Definitely. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Doug.